I have talked about yoga practice or pranayama practice. There are external vehicles. So the external vehicles that are supposed to be internal vehicles, they have to be shifted from doing to the medium of the ego mind that is used to manage the external activity. So how to create the shift? That is the practice of consciousness. That is where the practice of yoga asana as a physical discipline or breath work as a physical exercise, as a breathing exercise, to the spiritual exercise. Who is guiding it is the change that we need to really see. So when you practice asanas just as a physical exercise, you're just practicing only part of the whole. Physical body is just one part of the whole. There are many other parts. But the devil was showing different bodies, right? Body is just one part. And then there are pranamaya course, manamaya course, vigyanamaya course, anandamaya course. What happens? So when you practice part, the other part that is separated from the oneness is handling it. Means the ego mind handles it automatically. So in the sports world, when people practice sports or dance or gymnastics, they are doing physical part of activity. So automatically, in sports, who is the driver? Ego mind, competition, jealousy. I hate myself when I fail. You see, that means this is driven by ego that is comparing, competing, and it is only function, it functions in the field of relativity. And everybody is trying to get relatively better than other, or I'm trying to get relatively better than myself. And relatively better is an illusion. So what is the difference in yoga? Going to the total, not perfection, so that there is no such thing as perfection in yoga. That's not even, there is no such word as perfection in yoga. Yoga means being total and whole. And when you can be whole, you have reached the perfection, if you want to call it that way. So most people don't know this, so they practice yoga as with the, if, to the medium of the ego mind. I've told you that, but then, if you see, if you practice yoga, what are you usually trying to achieve? You're trying to get rid of the, some of the inhibitions, physical or mental or emotional inhibitions that have appeared on the surface of your life, on the surface of your body. So most people practice yoga to remove the surface symptoms. And that is what we do in the, our traditional healing system. Almost all the healing systems, when suppose you suffer from headache, you take ibuprofen or some headache pill. That's a traditional. Or you may do even holistic. You may say, I will drink more water, I'll do breathing exercise, I'll put acupressure points to heal. That is also partial because you are simply treating the symptoms. There is other whole part that needs to be healed 
is not addressed yet. And most people don't know what that part is. That's what yoga treats. What is that part? That is the part of you that has been built into like you regularly just eat the wrong foods, sleep on the wrong time, don't sleep enough, eat too much, work too hard, not take enough rest. That's a cause, right? That's a cause of the headache. So that part most people don't address. So in this yoga, in yoga and Ayurveda, this is the most unique definition of health. And that is, I haven't seen anywhere else that clearly explained. So in yoga it is called self, returning to the self. So that is swastya, that is the Sanskrit word. So being established in the self, and that self is whole, okay? So the treatment will be whole, the practice of yoga will be whole if you address <clears throat> symptoms as well as the cause. Symptoms are the effects, cause is hidden. So how do you practice yoga so that you are not ignoring symptoms but also addressing the cause that is hidden in you, in your, in your unconscious parents? So how to address the cause? And what is the cause? That's a, that's a question. So the, the cause is coming from your pre-programmed experiences of trauma, hurts, abuse, that everything that has been creating stress or created stress when it happened, when the traumatic event happened in your business, in your love life, in your family life, in your World War Three or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so people can have the World War Three symptoms too. Sometimes <laughs> they <laughs> they're, they're already explaining how it is going to happen and it is about to happen and you can have symptoms you are, just people started protecting with them storing their dry, like uh, dry food and so tell them rot and thinking businessmen where the, the bad air doesn't get there and there are symptoms so these are the symptoms <laughs> that you can treat and you are only treating half. And sometimes you can treat unconscious with also medication. So what happens to the unconscious when people get emotionally uh, are traumatized? What do they use? They use heavier medication. What does it do? It just temporarily removes the symptoms, but re doesn't remove the cause either. You see, that is also symptomatic treatment, and that is where most people practice yoga with a very superficial therapeutic effects. This is how to go to a really a deep, subtle practice that removes the cause as well as effect. So if you just only address one effect like headache, you have so many other symptoms that are showing up in your love life, family life, work life. They don't get, you, you, you cure headache. So if you just treat one symptom, all other nine remain untreated. And then even the one that you heal will be the unconscious life will begin to bring it back again. So healing the symptoms is temporary solution. Healing the cause is a permanent solution. So what is the cause? The ego mind has separated from the source of loving presence within. That's the cause. That's where all the stress is hidden from the past. Trauma, painful events, failures, divorces, sicknesses, many different ways. Every soul 
has experienced, that's what they need healing from. And that is why this yoga that connects you to the source is healing you from the basic cause of separation, conflict, and stress that cause 80% of all the illnesses. So 85%, where does it come from? Stress. Where does it live? In your own unconscious. So this yoga, this yoga nidra approach or a yoga therapy that, that I have developed is about how to go to the very cause. Means how to release the energies that are trapped in your traumatic memories and in your energy body in the form of energy blocks. So energy blocks are living in your chakra system, in your nervous sense system, in your glandular system, in your cells. It goes every aspect of your life giving functions. So how, and that is means your ego, your body is the temple of God, now it is a temple of residence for the ego mind, unconscious. That is, we call the internal memories of old traumas and painful hurts. So then, how to remove that along with the symptoms? So symptoms must be addressed. They are not to be ignored. Like symptoms, like everybody has lived to such an extent of unconscious that their symptoms needs immediate attention, operation. So you say that, well, I'm, I've been studying holistic approach, swastia, I'm going to go there, I'm going to wait for operation. No, take care of it. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? If you need to go on an immediate journey somewhere and you had a take ibuprofen. But what is the permanent solution? So what can you do even when you are caught in some kind of symptoms that tells you where it is coming from so that you are taking care of the symptoms and also learning how to get rid of it from the cause. So while you are, and most people do not want to when they are very sick or going through the divorce or relationship issue anywhere in the business or love life, family life, doesn't matter. They are just not dealing with it. They are taking medicine to remove the stress temporarily. And as soon as the effect of the medicine goes away, stress comes back, right? So that is a very poor solution that the whole world is following. So what is the distinction about real, what yoga says? Yoga says remove it from the cause where the real stress is created that you don't even have an access of just by treating the symptoms. Got it? This is why Patanjali said, yoga means witnessing the modifications of mind that disengages you not only from reactive thoughts that you think these are, these are me, but you also disconnecting from the ego mind from where it arises. So then this is pratyahara. Only you could, if you are practicing asana and pranayama, there is no other way to enter pratyahara. Like if you are practicing just hatha yoga as a physical discipline, how would you ever go to pratyahara? What would you do without meditation? How would you withdraw from your mind? Just through breath? That's not enough. So Patanjali says, witness is necessary along with breath. So he says, witness will connect you to the cause. That's why witness is the, treats the cause rather than just the symptoms. So, Symptoms you cannot just witness and get rid of right away. It's a long-term solution. So you take immediate solution for that. While you're working on long-term problem that lives within you, so what is it? So why am I having so many conflicts? 
with so many people, so many situations, every day, ongoingly, all the time. Why am I such a failure? No matter where I go, what I do, it just doesn't work. Why people are so many against me everywhere I go? Why people don't understand me? That's what your pre-programmed past is talking. It's not you. Thank God. That Make sure that it's not you. And you can let go of it once you understand it. You don't hold anybody responsible. So this is like taking responsibility for everything that, is, that appears to be happening because it was caused by someone or something. <coughs> this is a different path. You take responsibility. It means you are responsible for how you think about it, about what happened in the past, the trauma that happened, somebody who, your parents that messed up your life, or some abuser who abused you, took advantage of you. But it all happened. It was triggered by outside situation, but it was lived by your reactive perceptions that were already in you to begin with. So in our journey of life, we carry that from lifetime to lifetime. That's what Krishna says in, a, in Bhagavad Gita. So that is what is reacting to what happened and how it was perceived. And that is the one who attracted that to begin with. But you didn't know. Your unconscious attracted it. This is a little difficult to understand, but nothing happens without its connection to the karmic connection or link that somehow unknown uh, connections begin to happen in the positive way also, you see, and a negative way also, depending upon how you are right now. Like if you are, if you are so used to drinking, in a group you are, Immediately, you'll find the right person who will fulfill your habits. You will attract that person. If you are homosexual, you'll find that one out right there. Among 200 people, you'll find the right one. Do you see what I'm saying? That attraction is already there. Karma is there. So it will attract the right person. But you will not know who did that. Your pre-programmed condition passed. That is the cause. And that is what is so important to be removed from your life. And this yoga practice is all about how to remove it from the cause. By the way, Patanjali says, he says, if you return into the present moment, here and now, you are already disconnected from everything that happened in the past, that your memory, you are playing over and over, and cause, that's the cause of your sickness. There you go. Do you still understand? But how to let go of it, and then in the practice of yoga. So that's where I have developed all the different techniques in the practice of yoga nidra, affirmations, visualizations, techniques of breath work, postures, how to do, to go to the, such a level of from, from beta brainwaves to alpha and even deeper integrated state of brainwaves from where you disband that connection. And meditation takes you there. If you were still, if you have reactive thoughts about that, that happened in the past, what do you do? The victim, thoughts of victim who was the victim of the past people, places, and things, somebody else did it to you, how does it come up as karma? Your thoughts are your first, first appear in your mind. Then sometimes when, you, when it is in the mind, then it comes into verbal expression. Then it comes to, into physical expression. There are levels. So Patanjali says, just witness your thoughts about it. So whenever you have any conflict with anybody, 
you can start practicing this yoga right away. And then your relationship with your own memories will get removed because now you are taking responsible. Responsibility means I have ability to choose my response to what is happening through my reactive thoughts. Do you see? That means now you took the responsibility and once you take responsibility, you are working within the field of, of the field of effectiveness. You can make the change. But if you don't take the responsibility and you are the victim of somebody else did it, or working outside the circle of influence, you will never be able to solve it. You cannot influence it. Do you get it? So this is why this yoga of meditation in motion is very, very significant. That's why when I read Patanjali Yoga Sutras after the Prana Awakening experience in 1970, I saw the whole thing, everything solved for me. Like my whole life changed. Not only how I practice yoga, how I taught yoga, how I read about yoga, how I interacted with people and life situations and with myself, everything went through profound shift. And that's why immediately I wanted to build it, build those teachings into the practice of yoga so I can share how they can enter that kind of a shift themselves. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know what more I can say. <laughs> so, but would you, after when you are listening, this is the process, that's why I said practice, 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 right? So, if you don't practice it, it will remain as a memory of philosophy. It's not going to last too long. It will stay here and there because you got energetically also, and you got experientially also. But how many good experiences you have that you forget right away, and how many bad experiences you have, you never forget. You just repeat, repeat, and repeat. <laughs> so wherever you put your attention, that's what begins to grow. So if you put your attention on the negative experiences, that's what grows in your consciousness. So, how to practice yoga? So, so it is about, in your body, everything that people deal with in the practice of asanas, they are dealing with symptoms. Who is dealing with symptoms? Only ego mind can deal with symptoms and do the good job of handling it. So ego mind has created all the medical systems and it can use it, you can buy it, you can heal the symptoms, but you cannot heal the cause unless Patanjali says you go to the meditation. Do you see? So meditation is the secret. Meditation in every interaction that you are with the symptoms. The symptoms appear not only in the body when you do yoga, but whenever somebody triggers your reaction, your anger, your fear, your resistance, now your symptoms that are hidden in you, they revealed it to you. So it's in you, even though somebody else triggers your reaction, reaction is the symptom. It's not the cause. But where does it come from? Who I am not is talking about it. So this is what is integrated in the practice. So how do you practice? So that, so when you practice yoga asanas, you know, you go, you, whenever you practice yoga, you will notice that you will come to a stage where your body is resisting going any further, right? 
because there is stiffness in muscles or pain in joints or something that is what I call an edge. So if you are practicing in a physical discipline, you, it is interacted with edgy ego mind. An edgy ego mind engages into fight or flight reaction with it. So when you fight, you are a good yoga student. You got rid of it, you went beyond, you practiced, you didn't stop, you did kind of persistent yoga, and you are so much more flexible than you ever were 10 years ago. Now, are you healed? Did it, did it handle? Did you handle your emotional problems that you had with your wife, with your children, your husband, your parents? Not everything else is intact. Do you get it? So that's a part that is creating a lot of nuisance in your love life, family life, work life, or social life. It doesn't allow you to take be in fully loving interactions, in harmonious co-creation with anybody or anything that you try to do. But you can do it in harmony when you are get good, given good salary, but then eventually you don't like it because you haven't solved it from within. So many people look like they are in harmony because their ego has motivation to get more money, build a bigger house, that's why even when you're successful, you have reached the peak of recognition and nice social status and fame and name, you are unhappy. Why? Because you haven't solved the cause that lives in you. You only solve the effects. Like, how many people suffer from and they don't know why? This is the cause. So this, this yoga helps you to take your practice to a whole new level, completely whole new level. So you are solving it at the cause at the core. So when you solve it inside, so you are then comfortable to live with yourself, which, is, which means the way your mind functions, the way your emotion functions, you're not comfortable. So I wanted to check out whether how comfortable I was with myself. So I tried another way. So there is in a in a Ayurveda, there is a very ancient system called Kuti Pravesh. <coughs> the ancient days, some yogis go into it for months, and it is called. It's like a, there were a wall, and then there was a door this side, and then you walk pathway all around, and there is a door here, and you walk this way again, and there is a door here. And there was a third room, and it was completely dark. So I stayed there for seven days and seven nights with no phone, nothing to write, nothing to read, nobody to call. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I had to be with myself. <clears throat> and guess what? I was not happy with that. I just, first two days, it was like, what do I do? How do I spend my time? How, when do I sleep? When do I wake up? What do I, their daily routine completely disappeared. So first two days I started thinking like, I think I'll tell this doctor, Ayurvedic doctor, I think, I think I really saw what my problem is. <laughs> In just two days I really made it. <laughs> And I wanted to save my face if I wanted to come out. And so it was the dialogue I'm talking about. I wasn't going to do it, but that's where it was going. So I wanted to say, so I think, and then I started thinking like, that was a mistake to do whole week. <laughs> Two days is enough, I think. <laughs> so then I, I had to find a ways to be at peace with myself, with my mind, who is so used to the external activities 
and something to distract me from being with myself. And well, with a silent self, no problem. But then I had to go there. And once I went there, it was like, I got so ecstatic, so ecstatic. Instead of telling the doctor, I said, no, I think I should, I would like the regular treatment again because I think I'm paying for just being, doing nothing here. So it was like seven days. I did 14 days treatment of Ayurvedic oil massages and everything, different kind of treatments. And then seven days, nothing, just by myself. But that was the real thing mm -hmm. I was doing. So then I, when I, when I just relaxed and I was comfortable seeing who, what my mind was doing, I had to get readjusted to the silence that I am really. Then once I saw that meditation I went in, I went in deeper than ever because it was required. I mean, what do I do for survival? Some people sleep, but how much can you sleep in seven days and, and be comfortable with it? So that wasn't available either. I was already rested. How can I sleep? So I saw, part, I, I wanted to check out whether I, have, I am going the right way or not. So I've been practicing all along the way. Even then it was so difficult for a couple of days. So then, this is what you are learning, how to live with yourself that is causing you stressful thoughts and emotions when you are working on the edge. So you invite the witness. So you just fire the ego mind that is doing fight or flight reaction on the edge. You just witness those thoughts. So when you witness the thoughts, automatically the, the witness presence comes as a light. And like I told you yesterday, it just works on the darkness. They don't fight. And that's what I experienced when I had awakening. My body was creating the postures and going into the deeper, very deep, amazing kind of flexibility I saw. Why? Because the edge wasn't there to fight with for the witness. So I, my body became so extremely flexible. I saw myself doing some of the movements I could have never done from my waking state. That's what started happening. So I saw that witness automatically stops fighting with it. So it's a fight that makes it very hard for you to go through it. But fight can go through it, but it only removes the symptoms. Do you see? And symptoms is, once you remove it, it can come back. So how many world-class athletes, they just remove the symptoms in that particular area of competition, they become world-class athlete, and all they saw was just those limitations in their area of expertise of where they become world-class athletes. Everything else in their life problem, same. Nothing has changed. They have the same conflict with their family life or love life or work life. They're still drinking more than usual. They're more getting stuck with sex. They're more getting drugs with alcohol and drugs than anybody else. Do you see that? So when, because they saw only one side of the, and they are world-class athlete. What I'm talking about, this is not about comparatively getting better on a symptomatic level and by fight and getting beyond it. You never get beyond it by fight because the ego is behind it. So in sport, you can do physical fight or flight reaction, and it is considered to be the very plus. In business, you can do it too, because that's a plus. That's, that's why if you do all kinds of amazing things physically and in your business, 
of you are in the news. But if you just, if you do like, if you grow consciously, you're just dealing with all the problems, no news. Nobody would bring you on a television. <laughs> you are a great yogi, but so what? <laughs> you don't have an ego that has shows some difference in what, what breakthroughs you had on an unconscious level. So the whole society is functioning on supporting your unconscious progress, progress in the dimension of unconscious, solving the symptoms, but that is also unconscious way you can solve the symptoms, but only conscious way you can remove the cause. Do you see the difference? This is very just of practice of yoga in a proper understanding. But we'll talk further also if you have questions. So maybe we can maybe see how Patanjali says about the same things. Because I know you have been. We have been. So as, as those who were, have been in the sutra program, you guys, this is, again, basically what we've been talking about, again, in regards to the methodology of bringing stuff up is our here. past subliminal impressions that I'm feeling really good right here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the past. I mean, this is how I would be with Babuji. No matter how much Babuji would say, sit here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't say that because in India it's traditional. So he's so deep into the understanding of it. It feels really right. So, um, the, uh, the teachings that we were playing with yesterday, again, all those subliminal impressions and what Gurdjieff was talking about in regards to Ayurveda was what I had said about how Ayurveda has those six levels. Only the last two levels deal with the symptom, and the other four are preventative. You know, and that is very much not the medical Western uh, uh, system. The med Western medical really only deals with the last two, with the symptoms. And generally those bottom four, the first four levels of Ayurveda are all lifestyle changes. And that's why it's really difficult for people to do because they have to have the willpower to change their diet, to change how they deal in their work, to change their sleep habits, to change the source of, of where the stress is coming from and to do the personal work that really um, uh, makes changes at those levels. And that's where our addictions are, is, you know, I, I mean, just ask someone to change their diet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the biggest ones. Biggest one, <clears throat> biggest violation of the body. Swami Kripalu, um, uh, uh, saying that I really like is, um, that a yogi, that, that yoga is all about the mouth. That, that a yogi is conscious about what comes out of the mouth and what goes in the mouth. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's the doorway right here of the consciousness. Be aware of what comes out of it. Be aware of what goes into it. Um, I, I remember telling my son that really young. To this day, he uses that. Um, Babaji also used to say that the, the, the tongue is the mischievous elf. And you sort of refer to that, you know, it's um, the, the one that gets us in trouble. And the yogi is really in charge of that tongue. Um, and it's and in the food wise and talk wise, both ways. Like all the problems you have in relationship, is something just fell out in your tongue talking. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh my God, I that. And that person will never forget you. They will just really nail into it and keep you responsible. That you mean that, and you mean that forever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting because the tongue also, in terms of science, is very interesting how the tongue is related to the brain. I mean, if you consider what the tongue does in regards to language and the way that it moves and the way that the tongue speaks from our brain. So really, there's a, that, that, that's not just a metaphor of being in charge of your tongue. Um, and in charge of the mischievous tongue. It's, there's a lot of yoga right, right here. Babaji also said, before speaking, consider whether your words are an improvement upon silence. <laughs> you know, 
And I like to say, who, who of us would be talking if we, if we did that? You know, of course, this was from a man who spent many years in silence. So, um, but I, I just want to say, Gerda, I want to build one of those rooms that you were talking about. I, one of the rooms with the doorway. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow, we got to build one of those rooms. <laughs> three, I mean, three walls, like, yeah. per room. Wow. And the yogis used to go, and this, is, this has disappeared from whole of India. There are only now two places, that too on the superficial level. What I did was most superficial. In old days, they used to do that for, yogi would enter that for whole month or mm -hmm. three months or six months. And there, the changes will be such that they will lose all their teeth mm -hmm. and their skin will change, then everything will begin to change. Mm -hmm. Because it was such an ancient technique that the yogi will become young again. Mm -hmm. So I have a book of a yogi who lived 400 years like that. Wow. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that very recent, you know, <clears throat> about 70 years ago, he, did, he was interviewed and so, so you can live longer. <laughs> um, but that's not the purpose. But you become conscious when you, when you have time. So as I'm getting older, my renunciation is happening naturally. I don't have to do it. From seeing and observing with the wisdom, that comes with an old age, comes naturally. So what, for example, when a couple is living in a big mansion, which have, they have 20 kids and grandchildren and everybody, when they retire, they said, this is a burden. So they go into apartment house, condominium, where everything is done there. So that's called renunciation. Like you don't want to manage all that thing and get nowhere. So once you know ahead of time, when you have energy and you know you don't want to manage these things and spend your energy in a such a superficial way. So now I don't have hardly anything to manage. And my life is so simple that all the time I need to serve. Otherwise, what else would I do? Study, write, serve, that's it. <coughs> so that's what remains. That's why service means you are taking your time from the excessive <coughs> mentally and mental and emotional way of habitual living and you give it up so that you have more time to express your higher self. That is unconscious self. You're spending time to manage all the things. So you now have less to manage and less unconsciousness to use it. Do you understand? So simplification of life. That's why in all religions they recommend renunciation. <clears throat> so Bhakti renounced. Like he had his mother, he had sisters, he had brother. He renounced everybody. So then he did not worry about their financial situation or their the, his financial situation was very bad, even for his mother. But he had to do that, so he did that. So that is done by renunciation, but renunciation is not to be done. When you consciously see how you are abusing your energy, doing something that's not getting you anywhere. It's only making you more and more stressed out and unhappy and miserable. But you are the once you know you disengage that energy and reconnect it to the bliss body that you are. Right there. You have it in you. When you look outside, you create nuisance. When you use inside, you create solution. Right. So simplify your life. Very, very simple. Just basic. That's it. That's what Devashi has. He was telling me, it's just simplify. So he's available to serve, express, and enjoy bringing the joy that he has. So there is only way you can pay back to the guru is do service to humanity. That you are paying back to the guru within you. 
Because you owe it to the Guru to give you. So then it, the service comes naturally. Surrender comes naturally. A simplification comes naturally. Otherwise it's like traditional way of doing it. So um, as you were speaking earlier in, in this talk, Gurdo, and you were talking about um, when you first came in, the role of guru, the role of teacher, and um, you used to teach and you still do about the sadguru, the, the external guru wakes up the sadguru within, um, sad meaning truth, the, the true seated guru, and in essence the sadguru is really that pure witness consciousness. Right, right. And the witness consciousness of the teacher awakens the witness consciousness within you. And um, as we were talking about this process of the three lower koshas, your body, which holds habitual patterns in the tissues, your prana body and energy body, which holds habitual patterns in the energy field, and your mental body, which holds habitual patterns in indoctrinated beliefs from your culture, from your parents, from your past, those will not release those subliminal impressions or habitual habits if they're gonna be met with criticism. They will release it if there's an established sadguru, a witness consciousness of compassionate, non-judgmental awareness. So once you establish compassionate, non-judgmental awareness, then these three lower koshas have a willingness to start releasing because they're met with awareness and with love. They're blessed, they're reunited. The source of their creation is seen, which is the self. We, we created them from either resisting them or desiring them in some way. And then when they return to the Sadhguru, they're blessed again. They go back into neutral fields. You can choose them or not choose them. And the beauty of having an external guru who lights up the witness consciousness within, and if you don't have self-love yourself, the feeling is that there's someone here who does love you. And so the stuff does start coming up in the face and in the field of someone who is sharing that witness consciousness with you. And a good therapist, I always say, if, a good, if therapy is really going to be good, the therapist is simply holding witness consciousness. And again, if they're not, nothing comes up. As a matter of fact, things get compounded because that therapist then is using their viewpoints to actually solidify again, oh yes, let's blame your father, and oh yes, let's blame your mother, and oh yes, you got it all figured out, and now it's even more solidified. You know, you got it locked down in the truth, and the ego's got it, you know, all the good reasons about why, you know, we are the way we are. And it's really only Even that, if they have written many books and without world famous, still they will lock it up. Most people think like because they are so famous, they believe their word. Because they have a big following, so that's a real guru. That's a kind of misperceptions. And the beauty of all of this is that another level, you don't even need to understand it. <laughs> you know, like so many people come into the presence of someone who has a loving witness consciousness, and the self-love starts to be generated. You know, and, and you know, you don't need to know the methodology, but it's also very interesting to know the methodology and to begin to do it deliberately and go, wow, this, you know, Patanjali has laid out a very systematic approach. It's really science. It's the science of being human. It's our natural birthright. It's not meant to be a mystical disempowering process. It's meant to be a very empowering process where we put you know, as I said, I, I like to start the morning putting my sadguru, putting my witness consciousness on the throne. You know, yep, you know, start, rather than have the day grab me and take me and then I'm in reaction, start with the practice, put the witness consciousness in the chariot and then be in charge of the attention. And again, use the day to allow whatever's coming up to be met by the sadguru within. Right, so that is intention word that the word she just said is very significant in the practice of I am yoga. In the, because in the beginning, you cannot practice as, as effectively meditation. But what does the meditation do? It, it brings integration. It brings you into yoga, experience of yoga. It brings 
it resolves conflicts and restores the harmony. So we begin with integrative intention with deliberate action. So deliberate is removing the habitual way of unconscious way. So this is what I call the first part of posture of consciousness. And then there are two parts to every posture, the doing and doing in such a conscious way with integrative intention that at the end of it, you are just ready to jump into oneness, second half, where surrender happens completely. So each posture is, has built into it the entire journey of doing, how to create the shift from doing to non-doing presence, where doing happens through integrative intention. You see, mm -hmm. willful action that I used to call it. Mm -hmm. Willful, conscious, deliberate action, which is most people do mechanical action. action. And we, we did talk yesterday about will and surrender, which were big teachings at Kripalu um, uh, from Gurudev. You know, the aspect of will and the, you know, this is what I desire and the aspect of surrender, let it all go, the non-attachment. How do those two constantly play together to move us forward. Um, Gurdo, I have a request, which of course you can decline, but would you guide us in Analom Balom or Nadi Shodna in some way, some form yeah, yeah. Of, of yeah, yeah. either of those, or in any way that you wish? Okay, you may stand up first, because you have been sitting too long. Uh, <laughs> Blood in the legs. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, hand your It has become active in your body. <coughs> it has changed your breathing pattern. Whichever way it was, it's interrupted by breath. And when you relax, it brings you back into rhythm naturally. <coughs> Excuse me, let's all sit down. So what I said, last sentence is when you relax with the energy that shifted with breathing, relaxation brings it the balance. The doing interrupted it. The difference, you have to really listen. Doing interrupted your whatever way it was before, but relaxation is restores the balance. Mm -hmm. So in pranayama also, the <clears throat> alternate nostril is already doing balancing because of alternating each side from sympathetic to parasympathetic, sun to moon, and moon to sun. Sympathetic to parasympathetic, parasympathetic to sympathetic. You are switching interact interaction between the two opposites. So when you bring balance, Oppositions that was introduced mentally or emotionally in the way you were thinking, feeling, and being is now interrupted. It brings you in balance using the breath as a medium. But relaxation comes with it as you witness your thoughts so that you are not, or just focus so thoroughly in your breathing itself that will do it too. So 
That means you will bring all your thoughts to concentration. So what is concentration? Preparation for meditation. Do you understand? So concentration is a foundation of meditation. And then when you, when you focus fully on breathing exercise, like you did yesterday, I guided you to pay focus on the, the outflow. So slow, steady, unbroken, uniform, which makes it very easy to focus. That's why it is so powerful technique, because the technique is very engaging. So that's what the technique of meditation means. Like, it should be such that it automatically reduces mental or emotional agitations, right? So this is introductory to the Anurobhilam Pranayam. So you understand. So when you understand, it works better. <clears throat> I'm going to just take a sip of water. It's right there. Mm -hmm. A sip of water. It's right there. Yeah. So sit up straight. <clears throat> Keep your spine and head and neck in a straight line. And, you, and just adjust your seat so you are relaxed also at the same time. Now, you may just simply watch me to do the Anurobhilam Pranayam. And sometimes you can accompany it with locks, but not in the beginning. Actually, they are very difficult to practice for some people. So I would say just do Anurobhilam by itself. I used to do with locks. Um, So you use the right right hand, and this is not necessary, but this is more traditional approach to bend these two fingers. Or it's, it's not necessary. It will not diminish the power of alternate nostril breathing if you do it just by regular, okay? So I'm telling you all the secrets. <laughs> that that was a good one. So, so, because I'm talking to you more as an authority of having known that those superficial things doesn't doesn't create uh, as a, as much obstruction as as some of the key things as to how you breathe, how relaxed you are, how focused you are. That's that kind of thing. So I will breathe through left nostril, I will hold, and I breathe out through right. I will breathe in through the same right, hold, breathe out through left. Breathe in through the same left, hold. So that's the same thing. You already know. Okay? So you just watch me, okay?
but that is how you do it. Mm. I get I enter meditation right away while doing it. Try to open my eyes even. <coughs> so that's the way to do. It's like meditation in motion. In motion of what? Breath. <laughs> You're meditating. Really, it takes you in a very deep meditation very quickly. So you have to have a good uh, breathing uh, ability so that your nostrils are clear. So you should do neti, you should eat uh, um, so the food that doesn't create so much obstruction, in, like a mucus in your system. So when that is clear, your prana will work very well. So like when I do Kapalabhati Pranayam, <clears throat> it just, you can feel the difference. Like, let me show you. So that is <coughs> Kapal Bhadi. Can you feel the peace come over you <laughs> right away? <coughs> I do it and you get it. <laughs> it's because energy field spend, it just takes over. If you are receptive and open, you get it right away. You get the effect. I do the. I'm the cause, and you effect shows up there. Right. And Gerda, both of those, uh -huh. um, both of your demonstrations there, again go to. This is where again we could read in a book all the mechanics about inhale, hold, switch, exhale, um, but watching you do your pratyahara, go inside. Pratyahara, yes find that place so that you are in the non-doing state, like you said, right. a meditation in motion with the breath, with the movement, but we here with the breath is amazing. And then to combine that, like you just did, I, that Kapalabhati demonstration was, I mean, I, I don't know if you, your eyes were closed, but these eyes here were like this. <laughs> they were wide open. That was so powerful. And your consistency of your body just being in a, um, and the strength of your diaphragm, and also we're sitting here watching, and there's a part of you not even in your body in a weird way, but obviously very in your body. That was powerful. Yes. That was just, and again, that's, I'm putting words to something that was right. beyond yeah. words. <laughs> right, only you can experience it through the feeling energetically. That's what you're saying. But if you describe to somebody else, They'll say yes, but they don't know what saying yes to. <laughs> Even because to be nice, they'll say yes. <laughs> so, but they don't know what they said yes to. <laughs> so, so if you see, like most people, when they do kebab, they're trying so hard, their breath is not clear. <laughs> The mucus is there and the passages are not clear. <laughs> so it's not easy. So you have to do proper diet, balanced way of living, clear channels, a clear mind. They all come together uh, in your practice. Like my, my head is still spinning, like when you're drunk, how it feels. Mm. It's just like if I close my eyes, I'll drop in right away. Mm. <clears throat> mm. 
So, so one time I was watching the photograph of uh, Osho, and you know, in one of his magazines, he was lying down. So when you said something to that, I remember, I could see that he was truly so deeply relaxed, even in his sleep, that there was a difference in the way I saw him lying down and sleep than average person. So he went, he was going so deep. So one time I was tra traveling with the whole group in India and we got in the train and I just took a seat and everybody got in and somebody took a snapshot of me and they said, oh my God, look how relaxed he is. He's just like completely dropped in. So when you learn that art, no matter where you are, you just drop in and you relax. So that's what will happen with the practice of this understanding of how to relax from the core. Means how to disband all the stress producing thoughts and memories that come there, they get awakened by people, places and things, then you play in it. I have a photograph of you, Gerda, that um, I, I, you, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was you in St. Croix. And Gerda, uh, there was a pool, and it was nighttime, and the moon was out. And we had all gone to bed, and I came out, and Gerda was floating in the pool on his back with his legs in a lotus position. <laughs> <laughs> floating in the pool, and the moonlight was shimmering on him, and I was like, I just gotta get a photograph of this. So I, I did, I have a photograph of you. I have to, it's in a box somewhere, but it's one of my favorite photographs of you in lotus position, very relaxed in the moonlight floating. Yeah. See, this is what you would get. This is like when I demonstrated and guiding you, and then you shared, that showed that you got there rather than what I did. Do you understand the difference? Yes. So it gives you the proof that you can go there. That was the whole purpose. It empowers you rather than me as a yogi, look what I can do. That's not what the purpose is. But where I can go can be attainable for you and to demonstrate that you know now that you can go there anytime. That's the yoga. That empowers you, right? That's what I wanted because when I saw the awakening, like how just, just presence took over me and started acting on the prana before it was ego mind acting on prana. Presence take, took over and I was, I was guided into the posture. That means it was divine that took over. That's what now I'm teaching you how to do that for yourself. And that is energetic transmission through the Jnana Yoga understanding and experience Karma Yoga, both combination. Now you have both. Yeah. <laughs> so people talk either Jnana Yoga or do Karma Yoga. It's not, it must be connected. You have anything else that you want to ask? Yeah, share. Please come up here. So any question that came up from sharing or what Devarshi was teaching yesterday or anything, any other question that you may have, anything that I taught today, because teaching is one thing for you to understand fully, so you might have questions about it. Well, some of the people are not sharing. So I would like those who haven't shared also start sharing. Now you have, you have become comfortable with me. I'm not as dangerous. To come <laughs> I won't judge you. And you don't have to be the best sharer. 
so that you beat everybody else. <laughs> then you can be here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gurudev. Uh, thank you, Gurudev, for the teachings. Um, this morning, I have a question about um, ego and separation from the Sadhguru and um, so with karma yoga is that it seems to me that's a, a very good way to begin to quiet the ego and but if you do karma yoga with I, which I taught first day without without being attend to the end results and as soon as you are not attached to the end results, ego mind is doer is gone. Because mm -hmm. so that's why ego mind does the work. Yeah. Do you see? Now you are doing from the heart. Yeah. That is karma yoga. Yeah. Because the ego is constantly trying to direct me, us, into different paths, saying, yeah, if you do that, then you're not taking care of yourself, right? Yeah through maybe a sense of survival or, or something like no, that? No, there are many places where that question is appropriate. If you are too much, of course you're not doing karma yoga appropriately. Mm -hmm. That's just that. Yeah. That, so it's a balance. Balance. It's a what, what, you, what you know you are not doing in a consciously and mechanically is not karma yoga. Mm -hmm. You see? So karma yoga is doing, willfully doing something uh, with, with a deliberate action. Deliberate means you're not doing mechanically like you did in the past, habitually ate, habitually worked, habitually drove, habitually interacted, same kind of emotional interaction with the same people every day, and you expect different results. It's not going to happen is going to be the same. And then some people want to live long life. I don't know why and how they're going to get a different life if you live a long life. If you, they don't change how they are living and interacting mm -hmm. with life situations and relationships, is that is where the change comes. So being, in present, yoga. being present in your action is... Yes, yes. Being non-mechanical, right. non-habitual. So what is mechanical? Getting reactive in the same way, automatically, in the same situation. For the, like you can predict the person, like how they would be, because you know how they have been. They don't change. But when you're conscious, you're not predictable. Mm -hmm. You just change. And then when, when I'm conscious with someone who's habitual, is that also a way to... It allows you to see how you are when you are in habit, so you forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, can, you can allow them because you are seeing you are the victim, but don't make him the victim of your consciousness. So this is for you to practice, not for other people who don't practice they're not here. They don't know. Okay. So you have the responsibility to act in a conscious way so that as you don't, you learn not to judge yourself and also learn how not to judge others, which is the same as judging your way. Mm -hmm. And we talk about modeling, right? right, right. Um, does, that is modeling. That is modeling. You are just yeah. changing yourself and not, not expecting. Else. So, if this is not, then it's not called spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. It's called, this is called, what do you call the social worker consciousness. <laughs> I want to change everybody <laughs> for me to be at peace. I'm going to go for world peace. I'm really interested. I love, I love humanity, just hate people, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the people are funny. <laughs> Thank you. And those are the people who go for world peace. And they don't deal with people, they're right immediate to their, they can't even 
be the initiator of living in peace themselves to be the model and then they are trying to spread to the next level from from family to friends to society to culture to everywhere Thank you. So grateful to be here, and thank you for having us. Yeah. You talked earlier about renunciation and how renunciation arises with age. At a younger age, you know, we may also have, I have the desire to simplify my life. And mm -hmm. as um, I battle with my ego and the effects of the ego on my health, my mind, my family life, personal life, all those things, how do I... And I may have the urge to simplify, the urge to give things up. Um, how can I be sure that that's not coming from my ego mind? No. And, and, and it's, it's true. Right. And, and what is the, 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 the is, right action in terms of... Right. You know, if you are, you are simplifying because it makes it easy for you to be, to be more at ease with what you have to handle. So you are using it to be more at peace within yourself, connecting to the consciousness. And it has an obvious result. So obviously it's not an ego. It is to accommodate the consciousness for it to not to have to manage extraneous situation which only, which only tries to make you comfortable when you finish everything. So most people, when they retire, then they feel, <clears throat> then they, they're so much successful. Now they know how it all works. Now they cannot do anything about it. There is no room to go. And even their children don't want to do the same job they have been doing because they, they know their father's joy, life destroyed this job. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into it. But that's what happens to most parents who create the good, successful inheritance for their children, but they have ne neglected their own life. They made it, they made a success and they made a stress that came with it. Actually, when you simplify, you are making, you are adjusting where success and happiness come along with it together. That is called simplification. So, how do I move through the fear that comes up so that I can no, trust the simplification no, process? Because you know how it works. That's why you are learning this. So you know the fear that will hold on to it. I, I am trying to get rid of a lot of clothes in my... I don't use, but I don't have time. I find something and it is... Like I start giving up, I start giving up, but I want to do a real thorough job, but it is taking time to do that. I'm having, I haven't taken time to really thorough job, but it's not, it's not complicating my simple life. It's just sitting, sitting in the closet, that's all. <laughs> but it's still part of my clearing that I am not yet done. Last question. Should yeah. I have a sense of urgency about simplification or let have Yeah, urgency? all those things I have done. So all those major things, nothing I have, I don't have anything that I need to do on my own for myself that takes so much time out of my serving this work. So everything I do is free. I don't charge, I don't take any salary for what I do. My life needs are taken care of. So, and my security for the rest of my life, I have maybe another, at the most, 20 years, which is not, but, <laughs> but that's, what would I need for survival? So I don't try to strive more to get yeah. more money or get more success. So more success is relative. And that is elusive, and it keeps you caught 
and getting more without getting enough. How much more will you get that will be enough for insecure you who is trying to get more? You see, that's a problem. Insecurity is the problem. So when you know it's not working by understanding, relativity is an illusion. Like every ego is trying to get you caught into trying to get relatively better. And relatively better is no better than relatively better it was. <laughs> no, really. Like relatively better, can you? That person who is getting 20,000 salary and he was expecting 25 and he got 28, he's relatively much happier. And a person who was getting the same salary, he got relatively less. He's very disappointed. But, but both are relatively valued experiences of where you were before you got where you wanted to. So everything is mind thing. So it is like, I was always give an example. If, if you have three buckets and you have one bucket with very hot water in the left side and very ice cold water on the right side and a room temperature water, you put your hand in very hot and very cold and then bring it into the, into the bucket. One that was very cold will say it's warm. One that was very hot will say it is cooler. Your two hands are saying two different stories. Just because where they were before they came in. Do you understand? So if you are happy where you are, you're out of the trap of relativity. So get where you are very comfortable without straining yourself with too much with straining mentally, emotionally, with family situations, business situations, start getting happy with wherever you are. Simplify and it will become easier. Thank you. So what do you do? I operate a yoga and healing center with my wife. Oh, and yoga and healing center, where? Uh, Newburyport. Huh? Newburyport. Oh, I see. The, the I see. northeast coastal tip of Massachusetts. North, oh, of, north of Boston. North of Boston. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's wonderful. We're doing Pranatan yeah. yoga teacher training right now. Yeah, I like it. operating yoga studio is not easy. Mm -hmm. Right? Because this is why so many yoga studios, because they are good yogis, they want to do yoga, but they want to do, I mean, what, how do you make a living? So they open yoga studio. Now they don't know how to manage the studio and people and money and advertising. Like everything you don't want to do is now in your lap with what you want to do. a question or a big thing that I want to ask but I felt like if I didn't share or if I didn't say hi um, that I would really regret it. And I like uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> so, just uh, venture it. Like you, you don't want to do it. Do what you don't want to do. Yeah. Break your bad habit. Yeah. Um, coming here um, feels really special to me just because I just graduated Pranatan with Devarshi last year and he means a lot to me. And so meeting you means a lot to me and like seeing how um, it just all like comes together. Like, I don't know, it's just really beautiful and I'm just really happy to be here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So what is, how, would, how does it feel now that you are here? Something else awaken? It helps me to, it's just like, it feels good to rehear everything again. And a lot of the stuff you said just, 
kind of like re-solidifies because I, it's funny, I like to say, oh, I have a good and witness consciousness, but it's always like I come back to like, oh, okay, that's me, oh, okay, I'm thinking this thought, oh, okay, and it's just like um, the awareness just keeps coming back, um, and it just inspires me to keep the practice going, I think, it's more so, um, and I'm just excited to like continue for like the rest of my life and I'm like excited if I ever become old to be old but <laughs> I don't know like seeing all the like for some reason I ha like want gray hair which is really weird but like seeing like all these lovely people here that are just like older and have gray hair is like uh, like inspiring <laughs> See, the older people, when you see older people, gray hair, and really happy and healthy, you said, my fear of gray hair has no place. I can be that. You see? That's, that's, that's what is very important. Because when I see some people who are older, and, but they don't, they don't accept it and live in a limited way, they still are expressing their heart, mm. they are expressing their love to the world, they are sharing, they are giving. Mm. That's so beautiful, mm. wonderful life. Yeah. Ooh, I just thought of something. So last night we were talking a lot about Samyama and we were having some issues, or some of us were having some issues really um, figuring it out. So if you could talk about Samyama at all. So how does Samyama handle it? Handle what? Handle the issue. What is, what is, you were trying to so solve, talking about some yama and some issues came up, right? Is that what you said? Oh yeah, like we were having a hard time understanding some yama. And I'm, I'm gonna give a yeah. little context. So we led these exercises yesterday, Gurdjieff. We were or, uh, uh, reading Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And in there, he talks about dharna, dhyana, and samadhi. And then he starts talking about samyama, which is this process sort of beyond those three of being fully absorbed in objects without distortions from the mind. So he's saying start with gross material objects, and then you work your way up to animate objects, things that have more life form, and then up to subtler forms like beliefs or feelings um, that have more possibility of projecting um, stuff onto it because they're projections themselves. So he says start with the simple things yeah. where it is like feel what it feels like to be that glass of water without projecting onto it like oh that's a lovely glass of water or a bad glass of water or a, you know anything just to feel yeah. what it feels like. And yeah. these are exercises that he gives in the sutras that are gradient in terms of helping us to work on our projections. Right. You know. In other words, just uh, how to love a cat is Samayama would be good. Because cat is not doing anything to hurt you or abuse you, and yet you may have a problem about how she is behaving. She's coming and she's putting a cup on, and she's just brushing you to you, seems like loving, but when you try to get to her, she just runs away. <laughs> I don't know what a cat like that, but that's a cat. <laughs> that's how cat do. <laughs> so you might have a dog, then it will be fine. <laughs> Actually, we talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> practice with Samyama everywhere. Mm -hmm. is this? That is such a beautiful practice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who hasn't shared? How about you? Randy. Come on. <laughs> oh, David. So I wasn't planning to share, but one thing that's on my mind to share that I'd like to tell you is the story of how I ended up here. 
and uh, I did yoga teacher training with Dabarshi seven years ago, and uh, one of the practices that he initiated us into was the practice of chanting Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Ah, yes. And uh, that's a practice that hasn't been a big part of my practice over the years, but has been something that I go to under certain circumstances. And about three years ago, I was on a road trip in the U.S. and I was driving through Alabama and I was pulled over by the police. And when I was pulled over, the police officer came to the car door and he said to me, looks like you were driving a little close to the white line, huh? Yeah, what? He said, it looks like you were driving a little close to the white line, huh? Why did you say that? And I thought, this is not gonna go well. <laughs> <laughs> and so it ended up that he arrested me and uh, I was locked up there for the night. I had some pot in my car. I was driving from Colorado back to New York and I drove through Alabama without thinking about it. And uh, I felt kind of, you know, abused and taken advantage of and they impounded my car and they took all of my things and I was uh, at a hotel that night after I had bailed myself out on a credit card. And uh, I started feeling really bad and the next day passed and... So, so what was the excuse for stopping you? Or he said I was driving a little close to the white line. A little close to the white line? Yes. <laughs> ah, I thought I heard white line. <laughs> what is he talking about? Please. I thought he was talking about some mystery or something. Yeah, I knew what he was talking about. And I knew it wasn't going to go well. And so I was stuck in Mobile, Alabama. And the day had that passed. They, they yeah. can do that far? Well, they pulled me over and then they started wondering what I was doing. He, I was had an out of state license plate. He thought I was a suspicious person. And so they, you know, took a drug dog, searched my car, and ended up putting me in, uh, in jail for the night. And so a couple of days had passed, I still didn't have my card, I didn't have my credit card, wallet, anything. I was stuck in Mobile, Alabama, and of course I was feeling quite upset. And I came to the practice of chanting, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And one of the practices when we started this in teacher training was, we were all given mala beads and we passed them around and chanted on everyone's beads. Mm -hmm. And while I was chanting in Mobile, Alabama, after being impounded and arrested and stuck in this weird, strange city, I started having the experience of being there with Sangha, chanting Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And in that place, I found a certain level of peace and forgiveness for what had happened, and I went to sleep. And the next day, I was eating dinner in a restaurant in town, still waiting for the unknown of when I could leave this, this town. And I was sitting there for dinner, and there's a woman sitting across from me who looks at me and saw my mala beads and asked me just about them and where they came from. And we started talking and she was traveling. And she would, somehow it came up that I trained with them at, at Kripalu and she said that she had studied with you at some place in some point in time. Um, and you know, just really like choked up, almost started crying there, waiting for the, you know, the, the meal to start, sitting there like, you know, I'm in Mobile, Alabama, the middle of nowhere. You know, under these circumstances, I chant to my teacher, to my sangha, and the next day, someone who has, you know, been in the presence of the teacher of my teachers shows up out of nowhere. And um, it was really an affirmation of sangha and practice. And That's beautiful. When I went back to the hotel, when we left the dinner, she was actually staying in the same hotel in the room above me. <laughs> wow. And so after that experience, I thought, at some point, I want to go and meet Gurudev and be in his presence. And this was the first opportunity since then, so I'm really excited. Oh, you. that's how the whole story wow. Wow. ended up here. Yeah. How nice. So, thank you. Thank you. Great story. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Amazing stories I hear. Oh. How, how everybody just ends up here. And, and some strange circumstances sometimes. So it's nice to hear. But you were meant to. So ultimately, sometimes with the wrong things that happened, that was also part of for you to come here. So it is, it is there are some unknown forces that are working that you cannot intellectually, rationally grasp, 
that how they are working for you to move towards further freedom from it. Yes. So if you accept them, then they, they, they guide you to the freedom. <clears throat> if you resist it, then you created your own barrier through the part that could have opened the door instead of closed the door. See, so that's what it is. Will you guide us in a closing ohm or <clears throat> thank you? Oh, by the way, tonight there is going to be the lineage film, and that is that was taken in that is some part of it was taken in the ceremony that we had done in India in Bapuji's temp Mahasamadhi temple area. So you may like to see that. So it is tonight. So make sure you come and enjoy it. We'll give you more insight. Okay. Let's stand together. <coughs> 